पाकिस्तान सबको रमज़ान मुबारक और आज हम फिर आपको आपके पास हाजिर हैं अपना मेरिट कोविड नाइन्टीन वेबिनार के साथ सो लेट मी इंट्रोड्यूस आर स्पीकर्स फॉर टनाइट इट्स डॉक्टर नूर महल कबानी हु इज एन क्रिटिकल केयर specialist and pulmonary and sleep medicine specialist she has a um, uh, masters in public health as well uh, she has more than 15 years experience in tele icu and currently manages about 100 hospitals with intensive care units uh, across 20 states in the in the united states and she'll further introduce herself we also have uh, Dr. Sara Tamur who's an assistant professor of medicine and specializing in infectious disease from the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City which is the as you know a hot spot of covid-19 so uh, i welcome all our other panelists panelists who will be introduced a bit later and welcome our attendees and Dr. Kabani please uh, get uh, start thank you very much assalam alaikum Uh, is my voice clear yes we can hear you okay okay assalam alaikum uh, ramzan mubarak to all that are online uh, and uh, my name is uh, dr noor mehal kabani as dr uh, iqbal said i am in houston and i work as a tele intensivist i've been in pulmonary critical care uh, for many years uh, and um, Uh, I'm here, and I'm very, very thankful to Sara Temur, who will introduce herself next. And she was kind enough to give us some uh, insight into the situation in New York with her case presentations. Sara, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Sara Temur, uh, and as um, Iqbal kindly introduced me, um, I'm an assistant professor of medicine um, at uh, Mount Sinai. and i specialize in infectious disease and basically 100% of what we are seeing right now unfortunately is covid so doctor ikbal do you want me to continue or would you like to introduce introduce the panelists uh, i think we'll get to the panelists in, in after your presentation okay so please go ahead and okay well um, i i um, uh, i had an interest in looking at uh, critical illness in pregnancy uh, as well as the fact that uh, the hospital i come from sir gangaram hospital uh, as as you all know is a covid hospital and i thought that i will pick this topic up i will ask my um, uh, head of the department from my alma mater to pitch in whenever uh, because she knows more about ob than i do but i will uh, go ahead and uh, discuss a few things with you uh, the uh, this pandemic has uh, as you all know is very multifaceted and it's brought a lot of issues um and one and there are clinical issues and epidemiologic issues uh, of uh, uh, of concern in in all this the strata of our uh, society uh, the pregnant women are a particularly vulnerable group of women as we know because they require care they require contact with healthcare at the same time uh, they are concerned about and we are concerned about their safety as well as ours when we are having frequent contact so some of the questions that were raised uh, uh, earlier in Ch- from the data that was coming out in china is what are the clinical manifestations of COVID- covid-19 different in pregnant women um is the management of covid-19 different in pregnant women does it cause pregnancy related complications or premature birth how likely is maternal and neonatal mortality we have seen that in other coronaviruses uh, as you all know um are pregnant women more likely to spread the sars-cov-2 infection and is sars cov v infection transmitted to the newborn i will try to touch upon some of these questions during my presentation um to the best that i can in the next 20 to 25 minutes um so the the bottom line is we do not have 
uh, original research in COVID-19. We just have uh, case studies and case series, correspondence, commentary, and letters to the editor that we are looking at. Um, one of them from China, this is a retrospective study where it showed uh, 37 pre uh, pregnant women and 38 newborns. I'm sorry, I think my phone just decided. Sorry about that. There. Um, so I so uh, uh, 37 pregnant women and 38 newborns. Uh, what I've noticed throughout the series is that a lot of the patients are ending up in cesarean sections, not necessarily because of fetal distress, but uh, sometimes due to maternal concerns and maybe sometimes due to healthcare worker related concerns in terms of the labor and delivery process, you know, uh, and exposure risks. Uh, I, I'm assuming that I don't have any firm data to, to talk about that. And Dr. Humayu can probably comment on that when we get to that. Uh, there was one neonatal death and there was no details that I could find of that. It didn't seem like it was related to the COVID infection per se, but it, it was, uh, and there was one death that was reported in the study. Um, uh, again, uh, COVID-19 and pregnancy can cause fetal distress, but not fetal. Uh, these were some of the observations from these case series. And these observations may or may not hold out true when we get more data. So there was no evidence of intrauterine infection of COVID-19 caused by, by vertical transmission. And we know there is some controversy about that already. Uh, nothing proven yet. Uh, the, uh, one of the recommendations from these case studies was that the infected or suspect mother should refrain from breastfeeding. Again, this is no longer a, a society recommendation. And we will talk about that in a minute. All mothers infected with COVID-19 should be monitored carefully. That goes wow. without saying saying uh, mothers and the fetus should be monitored during pregnancy and after delivery. And uh, the other observation was that the pregnancy and childbirth did not aggravate the course or symptoms of, and th this was all from the Chinese data. I'm not sure, like I said, I don't know whether this will bear out or not. And they are observations, not conclusions by any means. Uh, the, um, here are some other observations. Some of them are duplicate. This is from another study um, that all the pregnant patients were, uh, 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 the babies were tested and they were negative. Uh, again, the breastfeeding recommendation had been put in, but I have an asterisk denoting that uh, that's not something that is written in stone. Uh, if uh, COVID-19 is confirmed during pregnancy, both mother and fetus should be allowed, followed up extensively again. And again, the fetal distress and premature labor, respiratory distress, thrombocytopenia, abnormal liver functions were seen in some newborns out of the 10 that were studied in this particular study. So, um, uh, sorry, this is a duplicate of that slide. Uh, it is uh, uh, is it transmitted to the newborn? Again, vertical transmission has not been proven. There are some, uh, a couple of provocative findings. There was one in which the three neonates born, uh, this was by the, the study by Zheng, three neonates born to infected mothers developed uh, SARS-CoV-2 on uh, symptoms by day two. Now, was that in hospital transmission? Was that, I mean, was that in, in utero? We don't know. Uh, another study, nasopharyngeal swab, was positive 16 hours post-delivery. Why was it done 16 hours post-delivery? Could this also be a hospital transmission by contact? And then also, however, there was something provoking about IgG and IgM antibodies present in two-hour-old uh, uh, newborn. And IgM antibodies, as you know, do not cross the placenta. So there was this thing that did the patient develop it in utero or um, sort of unlikely that in two hours he would. So is, is there a placental transmission is the question. So the, these are some of the provocative small number of data that we have. Um, uh, I will uh, skip this slide. Uh, basically, the, it's saying the same thing. Uh, data, and you will have the slides. I, I hope you guys get a copy of the slides so that you can see all the references that I have in here as well. Um, the, uh, 
So I'm going to uh, call upon Sarah, uh, for, who was very kind and agreed to send me send us some cases from New York City. I thought that would be interesting. Um, and according to their uh, uh, protocol, Sarah, you can take it from here. The mild, moderate, and severe diseases are listed here. So I'll mute and I'll let you talk. Uh, sure. Uh, so basically, um, I mean, um, and is it, is it okay to speak in English or should I like do Urdu or doesn't matter, maybe? English is fine. English is fine. Okay. All right. So basically, I mean, we've developed our treatment protocols. Um, you, know, uh, you know, the treatment guidance is based on the severity of illness. And this is how severity of illness in patients with COVID-19 has been categorized. So there's mild disease, moderate disease, and severe disease. And essentially, um, you know, someone with mild disease, as you know, someone who um, is not short of breath, is maintaining their oxygen saturation, is the person who can stay at home and can be monitored off any type of treatment. Um, so these are people with O2 sats of more than 93% and those, you know, who have no radiographic evidence of pneumonia. Obviously, most of these patients are not being assessed because they're being asked not to come to the hospital and to stay home. Moderate disease is when you do have some hypoxia, so SATs less than 94%, or you have an infiltrate or something that's suggestive of pneumonia on your chest x-ray. Um, and then severe disease is what we have been seeing a lot of force, and in that there are, there are those with severe disease who have no end organ damage, and then there are those who do have evidence of end organ damage, and this would be uh, liver failure, kidney failure, et cetera. But the hypoxemia in severe cases is of course really uh, really bad, like so these are folks requiring high flow, oxygen, non-rebreather, getting intubated, et cetera. The next slide. So I'll just go through uh, two cases that I recently saw of uh, COVID-19 in pregnancy. Um, so the first case, 35-year-old uh, uh, female uh, nurse by profession, um, she came in uh, pregnant, 28 weeks pregnant. Uh, pregnancy up to that point had been um, uncomplicated. She came in complaining. Uh, her symptoms had started about seven days ago. She had low-grade fever and a dry cough. Uh, she was diagnosed by um, real-time PCR testing, nasopharyngeal swab, diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2, and was initially, um, you know, like for, for about a week coming into the hospital, she had not been that ill, but very quickly after her admission, she was intubated for severe hypoxic failure. Um, now, as you know, you may have seen some data on uh, coagulopathy and um, you know, with, associated with COVID-19 and uh, cytokine release syndrome, basically this really exuberant inflammatory response uh, that has been observed uh, with this condition. So as you can see in her initial lab values, the ferritin, CRP, D-dimer, LDH were all high. And the initial values are really on the lower side, but very quickly, into her hospital course, these were in the, in the thousands. Next. So she had already received a five-day course of hydroxychloroquine and the three-day course of azithromycin that was being done, based, that is being done still based on um, some observational, and I will say like completely inconclusive data, but she'd already received that treatment outpatient uh, remdesivir, as many of you may know, is an antiviral drug that's being looked at uh, for uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection and compassionate use of remdesivir is available uh, for, for pregnant women with COVID-19. So we were able to apply for, for that and get her the remdesivir. She was started on that. It's a 10-day course. It's an intravenous medication. And she actually did well. Initially, she got extubated, was transferred out of the ICU, but then around day eight of her remdesivir, while, while she was on the floor, she, uh, her otosats dropped and she got reintubated and very quickly after that went into cardiac arrest. She underwent emergency section at 29 weeks of pregnancy. Um, other treatments that she had received up to this point, she had received um, anticoagulation um, and she had also received uh, steroids actually for fetal lung majority. Materno fetal medicine did follow her throughout um, the course of her hospitalization. Uh, she unfortunately remains in the hospital. She ha has anoxic brain damage and off sedation really has no mental status. And at this point in time is undergoing evaluation to prognosticate um, her overall 
chance of neurologic recovery. Um, so this is uh, the chest x-ray, like, and I think Noor can comment on it more. It kind of shows you the typical uh, radiographic appearance of COVID-19. Uh, the second case was a 30-year-old female, first pregnancy, um, and she was a bit early on than the first patient, 24 weeks of pregnancy. Again, present, presenting with what are you know, now pretty well-known uh, symptoms of COVID-19, pretty classic fever, dry cough, shortness of breath, chest x-ray did show bilateral change, LDH-CRP was high, the neutrophil to lymphocyte uh, ratio was elevated, so she was lymphopenic placed on non-rebreather BiPAP. The initial swab tested neg uh, negative for the SARS-CoV-2. And this is, again, there's a teaching point here because um, you know, the, depending on what assay you're using, there can be false negatives. And then depending on how the NP, NP swab is collected, and if it's not appropriately connect, con uh, collected, there can be false negatives seen. So because our clinical picture was extremely concerning, um, uh, um, a repeat swab was sent and that uh, resulted positive. She also underwent CTA, which was negative for PE. Um, next slide. And this is again her chest x-ray kind of showing bilateral you know, uh, ground glass uh, change. Next. And this is her CT scan. So again, you can see like the bilateral changes and I'll let Noor comment on it more as a pulmonologist, critical care uh, specialist. Next. So she, uh, so the second swab did come back positive. She also got remdesivir. She was started on it through the same compassionate use uh, protocol. And then another thing that we have been doing uh, at Mount Sinai and, and certainly in, in many other places is the use of convalescent plasma. So, so folks who have recovered from uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, if their antibody titers are high, they can qualify as donors. So convalescent plasma was used uh, for treatment in this patient's case. Um, she was intubated, extubated four days and still in the hospital, um, still pregnant, like her baby's been doing fine. And other than just some mild transaminase elevation, which is also something we've been seeing in patients with COVID-19, she's currently doing well, just weaning off of um, oxygen before she uh, hopefully goes home. Next slide. So sorry, no. sorry, that's me. Yes. So let me go back to the x-rays that uh, Sarah was talking about. Thank you, Sarah, so much for, uh, for doing that. And if we have, once uh, we do the presentation, if you have questions, we'll come back to you if you are still there and not too tired. Is that so? Uh, this is the CT scan. Uh, the chest X ray is, as she described, you know, bilateral ground glass type appearance. I mean, the ground glass is more a CT dis description than an X ray description, but it pretty much looks like uh, reverse. Uh, uh, I think in the other, this first X ray showed it a little bit better. Uh, can you guys see my whole screen? You can see the X rays, correct? Hello? Yes. Yes, okay. we can see them. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, the x-rays basically uh, peripheral infiltrates. Uh, in this case, they are more in the lower lung fields. Um, and in the uh, CT scan, which is coming up in a minute. One second. I think I went the wrong way here. Sorry about that. We didn't practice this, Sarah. Okay. So here, the CT scan shows uh, some, some on, on the right side shows some air bronchogram type of picture, but you can see the crazy paving uh, picture as well that has been well described in the CT findings. This is just one slice of the CT. So that, these are the typical findings that you see in patients, but actually we have seen all kinds of different fi findings, including lymphadenopathy, which, is, which was initially said is not present in these patients. You know? So um, I'm going to go on with my presentation at this point. And uh, um, let me see. OK, here we are. Thank you. Uh, let me minimize my. 
so, you know, it, as we all know, we've seen this in SARS, we've seen this in MERS as well, as you'll see in, in some data I present, that pregnancy-induced changes uh, can actually uh, affect the response to respiratory illness, uh, uh, just like with the, with the, uh, all the other coronaviruses could also do that with COVID-19. Plus, there could be delays in diagnosis because the symptoms, some of the symptoms of pregnancy, they get uh, uh, rhinitis, they can get dyspnea, um, you know, the same symptoms as the COVID-19. And, and the symptoms, if they are not screened or questioned properly, could be missed, uh, thinking, oh, this is just pregnancy related. You know, there is also decrease in the functional residual capacity uh, of the lung, and there's a decreased ability to clear secretions because of the raised diaphragm and that causes when the patients do get disease could get much sicker. There's also the element of immunosuppression in pregnancy that we all know about and, and that again has predisposed, especially in H1N1, we saw a very high mortality rate in patients that were pregnant and those that were treated early uh, uh, later, uh, later on in the course of, the, of this uh, epidemic did better. And then again, there is the ACE2 level. This is again a controversial point. It's just a hypothesis. And actually today they've come out with some uh, new data that I came across a few minutes before the presentation that the ACE uh, Losardin especially has, is being tried and it could actually be protective. So uh, this estrogen progesterone level increase and increase in the level of uh, angiotensin renin leading to uh, facilitating infection uh, may or may not be a theory that will hold out uh, as literature develops. Um, the history of coronaviruses, the H1N1 influenza and MERS are, are, are explained here. In H1N1, uh, pregnant women accounted for only 1% of cases, but 5% of the deaths. That's a pretty significant number. And their outcomes were, of course, worse than the general population. Um, in SARS-CoV, uh, the mortality in a small series was as high as 25%. In MERS, uh, the fatality rate uh, was fairly high, in, but uh, I think it was close to, if I'm not mistaken, I'll have to go back and look at it again, but it was close to about 27% mortality rate, uh, but th this was only in 11 symptomatic cases that were reported. So, but overall we haven't seen, or we, at least we haven't, they haven't reported this kind of numbers for uh, COVID-19. That doesn't mean that cannot happen. So um, uh, the, another question that raises asymptomatic carriers, are they more like, are pregnant women more likely to, to spread SARS-CoV? And the reason behind that question is because the pregnant patients, uh, like Dr. Humayu put it to me when I was talking to her, that, uh, you know, delivery ka business to chalta rehta hai. You know, they are, we are going to see them. We are going, they're going to get healthcare exposure. So uh, it's not, uh, you know, surprising that they could be, gen they could be, uh, uh, they could themselves get infected or spread it to other people, which is why we have to be very careful in the way we we manage them in the healthcare system. Um, uh, the recent asymptomatic carrier rate reported was a, 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 as 14% in one of the New York City. Uh, I think there was just two hospitals included in that. Uh, and as I said before, the pregnant women, especially in the third trimester, have increased exposure to the healthcare system, putting themselves at risk as well as healthcare workers. And this has led to the universal screening of pregnant women admitted for labor and delivery. The question is, how do you screen them? Do you bring them all into the office to screen them? That would be counterproductive and would probably not help. So let's go on from here. So here we are trying to balance either, you know, uh, we all, all as, as physicians want to do the right thing for our patients. But in a pandemic, we also have to be very responsible about not increasing the transmission risk to ourselves or to others, including our loved ones and other patients. So that is the balance that we are all dealing with and discussing every night here. You know? 
So, uh, and luckily we are not alone. Uh, the world has come together to try to, to help. And uh, uh, th these are some, uh, some examples of the interim guidance and practice advisories that, have, that are available. I'm going to leave, leave it to you to go to these uh, pages if you're interested. But I'm going to just go through one algorithm very quickly if I, if I uh, have, and Dr. Iqbal, you can tell me if I'm going a little too slow. No, you're doing fine. Okay, oops, uh, that wasn't my plan. Okay, let's see if I can make this open up. Yeah, this, this will, uh, I'm just going to the algorithm so we can, we can take a look at it. So this was by the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the idea behind it was to do a safe triage and how to do a safe triage. The term that, that is used is called forward triage, which really means that you assess the patient very carefully before you bring them into any healthcare facility. How do you do that? Over the phone, telehealth visits, um, you know, on WhatsApp, on whatever you can. And, and now in the States right now, all restrictions on, on these media have also been lifted so that we can do this and facilitate uh, triage properly. So when you do triage the patient, you have, you assess the patient's symptoms, if they have any of these symptoms, and I think you all would know this, uh, fever, cough, difficulty in breathing, get GI symptoms. If the answer is no, they could get the routine prenatal care, whatever their stage of pregnancy is. If the answer to that is yes, then you do a uh, you, uh, you assess the severity of the illness. Do they have severe shortness of breath? Do they have uh, dehydration? Are they uh, getting confused? Uh, is there any uh, evidence of... Uh, 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 dry cough, et cetera, et cetera. If the answer is positive, the risk categories in the elevated risk in, and in, in the States, you have to notify the local infection control, uh, get them tested, whatever we need to do. No, and then they need to go to a facility for further care and assessment. And that is what why we call it forward triage, that they're already assessed before they come here. So the, only the high risk patients will be coming there or the ones that have the elevated risk, you know. And uh, uh, and uh, hopefully to a setting where they can be isolated in an isolation room uh, and seen by minimal healthcare uh, people rather than getting exposed to everybody that doesn't know what is uh, which patient is infected and which is not you know and these uh, providers that are seeing them at these healthcare facilities uh, are advised to use PPEs. Uh, and if the answer to the uh, severity of illness is no, then we still have to look at the comorbidities in this pregnant population and obstetric issues like preterm labor or inability to care for self or arrange follow-up if, if necessary because the business of, the, uh, of antenatal care has to go on a, a, with these patients no matter what. You know? So if they cannot, then if the answer is positive, they are considered moderate risk, again, sent to the facility from there they're evaluated more and decide whether they go, uh, you know, where they are going, are they going home with home care? If they are low risk, then they can be managed at home rather than uh, be put in a facility where they're going to expose everybody else if they turn out to be positive or get exposed and have an issue themselves, you know? So, and also utilize the resources, including the P, uh, P, PPEs that has been discussed, you know? I'm going to go back to the presentation. Just give me a second. Um, so, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the guidelines, they recommend, uh, sorry, um, uh, establishing a, what is known as a COVID zone, uh, where you have a changing area, you have a triage area, and from there, uh, as you can see, the triage people decide, and these people in the triage are all protected and should be uh, by, by uh, wearing the appropriate PPEs, go to the emergency room, labor ward, outpatient clinic, uh, and then either go to the high-risk high pregnancy ward or the postnatal ward. The important thing on this slide is that, you, uh, that it is advisable to have a dedicated ultrasound in the labor ward for these patients that require the ultrasound because you do have to do it. We know there is a risk, but we do have to, to, to do it uh, for the ones that require it. And then in the emergency unit, both an ultrasound in the, uh, and, and a chest X-ray facility, if one can provide that. 
So uh, the management overview for COVID-19, I will go through this very quickly. As we all know, no specific antiviral treatment available for COVID patients. Supportive treatment is what I've highlighted because that is very important as uh, Sarah can tell you that, you know, uh, that they come in in multiple organ failure, but if they get to you before with a good forward triage system uh, 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 and uh, their, their luck, then uh, you know you may not see them in that stage. But if you do see them critically ill, then supportive care is what you need to give. The mental health needs of the pregnant women need to be kept in mind. This is a very anxious group of, of women, rightly so. Uh, they are worried about themselves, their family, and the the uh, unborn child, uh, and uh, uh, and they're relatively healthy, so they are not really careful about what they might need to be careful about normally, you know. So, uh, um, but in this case, it's a different ball game altogether. Um, Everybody needs to get their routine prenatal care uh, and not unnecessary, but the part that is necessary. Hospital admission should only be done for suspected COVID patients in pregnant women, and it should be determined on the severity of symptoms. We went through that algorithm already. So coming back to prenatal care, uh, uh, as I said, the, uh, the and these are guidelines or the practice advisory from the American College of uh, Gynecology and Obstetrics that if they fall into the PUI category, which is patient under investigation, then they have to isolate themselves for for 14 days. Uh, you screen screen for COVID symptoms, preferably remotely, as uh, as I've said before, and you can get the history of TOC and the acronym for TOC that stands for travel occupation. For example, healthcare worker, clinical symptoms, as well as any history of being in a cluster, uh, if they've been to a gathering or anything like that. And of course, these are all questions that you can answer on the phone, on your cell phone. Uh, you know, you can have an algorithm. Dr. Mir uh, sent me a very nice one, which I have to get back to her on home care. And this could be something similar in OBGYN that can be done. Surveillance of patients with high risk obstetric conditions and comorbidities comor should be be done. And then, of course, consider mitigation of spreading by seeking alternate routes of delivery of care, which is what I'm trying to convey here that via phone or via telehealth, whatever you may have available. Um, this is a, a, a slide from Kaiser Permanente where the physician uh, is in her office or in her house, I don't know where. Uh, hopefully she's talking to the patient behind the part that we can't see, but you can see the patient and the baby on the screen. So even postnatally, um, they, currently they are trying not to see these patients. Uh, we just had a medical appointment in our family and we ended up having a virtual visit with our doctor, not, uh, not a uh, physical visit. Uh, so I'm just going to go through this, uh, uh, the portions of the uh, 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 practice advisory that I've been talking about that antenatal surveillance does need to be done. Uh, we need to consider the risk versus benefits and postpone or cancel some testing that may or may not be necessary. And, uh, 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 and, and I'm sure our esteemed OBGYN colleagues do know, uh, you know when something is necessary. But if it's forward triaged and decided, then that every patient doesn't have to come in for every routine visit that is no normally done in these patients. Ultrasound assessment of fetal growth is indicated in infected women due to the risk of the fetal growth restriction issue. Okay, so what is necessary, the whole idea of this whole guideline is that what is necessary needs to be done and done safely. What is not necessary can be postponed, such as elective things. Uh, similarly here, this is uh, also from the uh, International Society of uh, Ultrasound for OBGYN and the Society of uh, uh, Canada, uh, uh, the SOCG, uh, or I think it's SOGC, Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology for Canada, uh, that some of the guidelines are there. And the most emphasis is on the protective equipment for the healthcare workers. Um, your own glasses are not enough. You need the goggles protection, eye shield, what, depending on your situation. Um, early epidural should be considered. There's insufficient evidence about cleaning, disinfecting, and the risk of aerosolization with nitrous oxide labor analgesia. Dr. Iqbal could uh, um, 
give his valuable input in this one. And then uh, there is uh, also some other uh, recommendations like del delayed cord clamping. There's been conflicting evidence. Uh, ACO ACOG uh, says it may be considered. Uh, the uh, ultrasound society says immediate cl uh, clamping and transfer. The, the idea is that if you delay it, then the uh, neonate says they're longer and more chances of hospital uh, acquired infection is what I got out of it. That that's why there's a there's a conflict about this. And then uh, the the Canadian society recommended uh, delayed uh, cord clamping, so they were not so worried about it. So something to talk think about. Um, the uh, elective procedures like tubal sterilization, unless they are done during a C-section, should not be done in, the, in this situation, like any other elective surgery. Uh, the infants born to COVID-19 positive mothers should be considered as a patient under investigation. And, and now the recommendation is to separate them from healthy infants, but not necessarily from the mother. This is what I was uh, talking about. The decision regarding mother-infant contact for suspected or confirmed COVID uh, mother and her baby should be based on a shared case-by-case uh, -case, uh, basis between the mother and the clinical team. Okay. Breastfeeding with proper hand washing uh, can be considered. And again, this is uh, between the mother and the clinical team. It is not a no-no like it was discussed in the early literature from China. But what I wanted to show is, and, and Sarah commented on the thromboembotic episodes, uh, and we all know them now, and all of us are coming across these, but the, the, the uh, practice advisory advises low molecular weight heparin for 10 days to all confirmed COVID-19 mothers upon discharge, no matter what the route of delivery is, whether it is a C-section or the normal vaginal delivery, as we all know that pregnant women are prone to more uh, thrombotic events. And, uh, you know, we were discussing this before the seminar also, but there is a, there is a, the guidelines tell us to go ahead and give these patients low molecular weight. And of course, the common sense thing is to expedite discharge uh, of healthy mothers and baby. Um, corticosteroid use has been an uh, area of controversy in COVID-19, so I'll spend a little bit of time. Now here, the context is a little different. We are not talking about severely ill corticosteroid, uh, se severely ill, critically ill uh, women. We are talking about patients that go into preterm labor and we have to give them corticosteroids for fetal maturation. So again, the, uh, the guidelines are a little bit uh, conflicting. In, in the patient that Sarah presented, the patient was given uh, one patient that uh, was, near, was at the risk of preterm birth was given corticosteroids for fetal lung maturity. Uh, so the uh, ACOG or the American College uh, uh, says that we can give it at 27 to 33 weeks, but it is not offered from 34 to 37 weeks. I'll leave, leave it to my obstetrician colleagues to comment upon that, you know. Uh, and then, of course, every case has to be modified according to the risk risk uh, uh, benefit issue. The RCOG, uh, which is the from UK and the Canadian Society recommend giving the corticosteroids as indicated. Magnesium is another thing that we, uh, that is used in labor and delivery. Um, it is used for fetal protection. And there is some concern that if the patient is symptomatic with COVID-19, hypoxemia, and we depress the respiratory system, we could Versus the, the mother's condition. So uh, again, a, a risk versus uh, a benefit issue. You talk, you look, also look at the patient's renal function, also look at how much fluid is being administered. We, are, we know about the fluid restrictive strategy for COVID-19. So if they're symptomatic with x-ray changes, then we have to be worried about that. One suggestion from the society was to give only one single dose of magnesium sul uh, sulfate as an alternative to the usual drip that is used or the usual dosing. Um, I'll just quickly go through the critically ill patients that, you know, what can be used, what can't be used. Remdesivir, yes, it can be used. Hydroxychloroquine can be used. Tocilizumab can be used. Vasodilated therapy with nitrous oxide has been used before. Epoprostenol can be used, but it is not recommended uh, in critically ill patients, not because of the any kind of uh, uh, problem with the drug, but it is that it is extremely st sticky and it is a problem when you're proning the patient and it's not easy to use. So uh, neuromuscular blockade is safe. ECMO 
has been used successfully. NIH guidelines now do not advocate its use. Prone positioning can be done in pregnant patients, but need adequate bolstering and of course help of our OBGYN colleagues to advise us. And also I would just uh, mention that if you have a hypoxemic patient uh, that is pregnant, just from knowing general critical care uh, in pregnancy, that putting them in the left lateral uh, position would help to remove the pressure uh, from the IVC and, uh, uh, and the intra-abdominal content. So that would be something to do. Uh, uh, steroids at 34 weeks, if, if, if it benefits the fet fetus, can be used. Uh, I'm going to go uh, move on to, the, uh, to my uh, uh, emphasis on using uh, technology in whatever form, cell phones, as I said, have a two tablet situation. If you're in the hospital, you, a patient can have a tablet and, and the, the care providers can be outside the room and the tablets can be connected, which is a simple, cheaper, a cheaper venture than the, the ICU that I work in, which is extremely expensive and complicated, but it has still been very, very useful as I'll show you in a minute. So there was, there, this was a, a New England Journal uh, Medicine perspective on March 11 that says, I would advise you to read that and it's got good references. It says virtually perfect telemedicine for COVID-19. And it describes how we can do some of the steps remotely and not put ourselves and the patients at risk. So uh, this is a picture of what my EICU looks like. This is not me, but uh, this is our EICU, uh, what ours looks like. We have uh, uh, multiple screen monitors with x-rays, uh, multiple uh, uh, screens where we can pull up uh, a patient. Uh, this particular screen has the patient. This has the data of severity on it. This has the vital signs that are, uh, the nurses are looking at and warning us. You can put, oops, you can, that was, Okay, you, you can pull up x-rays, etc. And then this is what the, the EICU looks like. I will take this uh, time if uh, Dr. Iqbal is okay with it to show you a very short clip of the EICU that uh, it's not the one I work okay, if in. If it's short, then that'll be fine because we are- Two minutes. Okay. Uh, I, I, and I'll, I, I'll stop it in, in one and a half minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. Let, let me just go to it. Give me one second. I, uh, okay, there you go. Come on. We don't hear any sound, Dr. Kabani. Oh, no sound? No, I'm not hearing anything. Can but you hear them now? Oh, I'm sorry about that. That's that's fine. We're, we're getting the gist of how they're yeah. doing it. So. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop it since you can't hear the sound. I, I didn't test that part here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let me... I guess I'm still learning this part of the technology. We all are. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, so I, I'm going to end there. And uh, um, the the whole idea was for you to see what the structure looks like. And the URLs are there. You're very welcome. If you just Google EICU videos, you'll be able to see them. So if anybody who didn't hear and would like to, this one was from First Baptist Health in Florida. Um, so, and, they're, they're, and they're available on YouTube. So over to you, Dr. Iqbal. Sorry about taking- Thank you, thank you very much. Longer in the interest of time. But first of all, let me thank you and, and Dr. Sarah for a phenomenal presentation and, and lecture. It's really kind of eye-opening, and especially the cases, uh, frightening uh, cases from New York. And we'll, we'll discuss that. I just want to introduce 
all the panelists uh, that have taken the trouble to join us. Um, and starting with uh, Professor Shamsa Humaya, who is right in the middle of this specialty. So, uh, Professor if Shamsa, I, you please. Assalamualaikum. I am Dr. Shamsa Humaya, Professor and Head of Gynae Department, Fatmaina Medical University, and uh, Vice President, Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Pakistan. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Bushra Ali. Um, I'm Bushra Jamil. I'm a professor of internal medicine and infectious diseases at the Aga Khan University. And I'm also the president of Medical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases Society of Pakistan. Thank you very much. Dr. Kaleem Ahmed is here. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Kaleem Ahmed, uh, I'm a pulmonary and critical care and sleep medicine here in the Maryland, US. Dr. Mariam Moten. Thank you, Dr. Kaleem. Assalamu I'm Mariam Moten. I'm a cardiologist in Loma Linda, California, and I'm professor of medicine at Loma Linda University, as well as UCR, and the president-elect for APCNA. Thank you, Dr. Moten. Dr. Nigat Ahmed, please. Professor Nigat Mir Ahmed, uh, I am chair of rheumatology um, at CPSP and and chair and founder of Trustee of Arthritis Care Foundation, which is working hard to support the doctors and patients. Thank you very much. We also have uh, Dr. Nuzat Ashai. Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Nuzat Ashai, a Cleveland Clinic nephrologist. I'm based in Cleveland, Ohio, and medical director of uh, the dialysis unit on the West Side. Thank you very much. And we also have our uh, merit chair, or co chair, Dr. Shahid Rafiq. Yes, alaikum. Thank you, um, Iqbal. Um, I am a uh, Western neurologist and uh, uh, practice neurology and sleep medicine just north of Washington, D.C. in Frederick, Maryland. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all the panelists. Uh, it's really very impressive, the wide spectrum and breadth of expertise here. So we are very grateful for that. Uh, I. Uh, I am a pediatric anesthesiologist based on, in Dallas, Texas, and uh, really have learned a lot from all my colleagues in this, in, in this uh, series. So we'll start with a question answer session. Uh, and I know we're a little short of time. We'll go a little bit over, and I understand people have to uh, go about their day and you know, observe Ramadan. So please uh, don't. If you, if you have a question and you're not able to stay, please uh, send it in a message and we'll try to answer it later. So the que first question is by Dr. Amjad Iqbal uh, to the panel. Uh, I would address it to uh, all the panel, but especially to Dr. Sarah Thamur. Is does pregnancy outcome vary by the trimester of presentation? So I, I think, um... You were asking me this question uh, before we. <laughs> That's correct. Now it's been asked by one of the one of the t um, attendees. So right, yeah. yeah. So I mean, I don't think we know the answer to that. Like, we don't know the answer to that question specific to COVID nineteen. Um, I guess you know you can you can try to understand the risk based on the biologic, the physiologic changes that are taking place as pregnancy is progressing. So I would think that later in uh, the course of pregnancy in later trimesters, the risk of severe disease is probably higher just because of all of the physiologic changes that are taking place in your body, like because of the pregnancy. But we don't know this specifically for COVID-19 yet. Okay, thank you. I do have a, I have a follow-up question to that. In your two cases, was any of the cases, I mean, what was the, their other characteristics like BMI, race, were there any features of preeclampsia? Uh, they were both more than 20 weeks of gestation. So was there any, uh, any other features that would put them in a risk category? Yeah, like so, so one of the females, like one of the patients who ended up with anoxic brain damage did have a high BMI, uh, but was otherwise really very healthy. I mean, there was some reported history of eczema, but, but, but no biologics, nothing. She was not on any immune suppressants, et cetera. The other patient was, was, was healthy with no reported past medical history. For both women, the pregnancy had been uncomplicated up till that point in time. Um, and I'm sorry, there was another question? 
Uh, no, thank you. That that uh, okay. That thank you for answering that. And uh, I'd like to uh, ask Dr. Uh, Shamsa Homayo at this point uh, to weigh in in some of the issues discussed in our presentation. Dr. Shamsa, sorry, I'm trying to unmute you here. Walid, can you please unmute uh, Professor Humayun? I think you're unmuted, Professor Humayun. G. It was a fantastic presentation. Dr. Kabani ne almost every aspect she touched and she covered very comprehensively. Uh, as far as uh, our practice is concerned, we did not get any uh, patient of that severity. Jo unhone bataye hain, jis mein intubation karni padi ya wo majority of patients jo hamare paas aaye hain abhi tak. Every day we are getting two, three women uh, uh, diagnosed with the COVID. But uh, their course uh, is almost went smooth. Uh, 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 one thing debatable was that you have to manage the stadium section or the labor patient. Ko apne manage karna hai. Since hamare pa, yahan pe usually doctors they, uh, manage patients during labor rather than midwives. So uh, humne as a policy ye kiya ke if the, you think that labor is going to take long and you need to check patient uh, frequently to se better ye ke, uh, spinal anesthesia mein patient ka cesarean kar dein, rather than uh, uh, exposing yourself to the risk of uh, COVID infection. Or if labor is going smooth and you uh, and, and are anticipating uh, a quick delivery, then it's okay. So far, we have a patient did not deliver to any who are because uh, in our set of UVT patients with the normal delivery, they deliver nearby or uh, uh, home deliveries. Be a be holding it. So, so far, we have a surgeon section skin. We have a surgeon section spinal anesthesia, regional anesthesia, and all those women they are discharged uh, uh, home in a satisfactory condition. But chongke swab humare abhi tak jo humne kiye wo to negative aaye. So I don't think that there's a vertical transmission. And as I discussed earlier, hum ne bachon ko separate uh, mother se karke rakte hain. Though they are in the same area, lekin uh, attendant is uh, looking after the patient. Once the pediatrician or the neonatologist says that baby is okay, and the, after the first attendance. So, वो तो हमारा उस तरह से नहीं है। एक steroids की यहाँ पे बात हो रही थी। So, I don't think that steroids are going to uh, have any effect on the progression of pregnancy or on the outcome of the baby। और usual dose ही हम दे रहे हैं जो uh, wherever uh, there is a risk of preterm labor। Otherwise, हमारे पास कोई ऐसा patient नहीं आया जिसका को को preterm हो। Rather, we kept a patient। She was at 37 weeks uh, with previous one C-section। and we were anticipating that labor mein na jan, jan, today is 39 weeks and uh, she did not go into labor. So, if I data, I will know how the COVID is affecting pregnancy or pregnancies has any effect on the progression of uh, COVID. So far, we don't have uh, an extensive data. We can base kar sake ya kuch bata sake. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question uh, for you, uh, uh, Dr. Shamsa, okay. Dr. Shamsa, and as well as to our, uh, our speakers, uh, about uh, anticoagulation in a COVID-positive pregnant lady. I think from what Thank I you. heard about the recommendations that they be given low-dose heparin for 10 days in the uh, postpartum period, uh, on discharge is that is that uh, for Dr. Uh, Nurmal Kabani is that is that the stance of the ACOG and other organizations? That's correct. Th this recommendation is coming from ACOG and I think also from our COG. Dr. Shamsa can probably, um, Dr. Humayun you can probably uh, verify that. Uh, but I know it is from a, a COG and it is on the presumption that the patients are pro, uh, you know, they are liable to 
as we know, there's a higher incidence of DVT and, and PE. And if they're COVID positive, then there, is, there could be even a higher incidence of uh, thrombotic events. Uh, so they are uh, doing it prophylactically. And that's, the, that's what they are. And again, these are all practice advisories. They are not guidelines. They are not mandatory. So, Professor Humayun, is that something that you, you, you are considering? Yes, absolutely. And I agree with her. And these are the guidelines. And in our patients, routinely uh, in Pakistan, DVT is not that common. And routinely, we don't uh, give any uh, anticoagulant even once we are doing elective surgeries or anything else. There is no risk here. Like every patient you put anticoagulation anticoagulation. Very few patients, they develop DVT. But here we have done our own that the patients who are going to our they usually stay with us for four days. Our state policy is that your patient will remain with you till uh, they have two negative swabs. So since patients are uh, admitted with us, then we put them anticoagulant pe dal dete, prophylactic. Thank you. There is another question which uh, uh, is interesting because uh, Dr. Sara Temur spoke about two patients, one of whom had uh, is, is still... Uh, you know, doing doing okay. She's waiting for her baby to be born. She's still in the hospital and was extubated. Uh, and if I remember correctly from this case, uh, Sara, that she is the one who received convalescent plasma of the two cases. Yes. Yes. So the question from Dr. Shazmi Khan is how high should the IgG of donors be that will be selected for convalescent plasma? What's the criteria for the plasma donors? Yeah, so I mean, um, and I'm not sure if this is standardized um, because you know it's all in the realm of an experiment right now. But the titer that we're using is one to three twenty. Like, if you're more than one to three twenty for the COVID antibody, you can be, uh, you know, you can qualify as a donor. There's no directed donation that's being done right now. Like, so it's not like you can ask. My mother recovered, can she donate to me, et cetera. It's not quite like that. But every patient who's coming into the hospital like, is being assessed for plasma therapy uh, with, with great consideration given to pregnant women, to immune suppressed folks. And uh, based on what we know about the use of such therapies against viruses, it's something that's helped to help, uh, it's, it's, it's felt to help early on. So once you know, you're severely sick, it's not going to help. Like, so it's in that first seven day window. Uh, before the patient is totally off the cliff, essentially, is when plasma is being offered. So a follow-up question to that is uh, of the, uh, you know, tens of thousands of patients who have recovered in the United States from, from COVID-19 positive infection, uh, how many have qualified or actually have donated to, um, to blood banks or whatever organization is collecting this plasma? Yeah, so I don't think we have those numbers like, you know, like the donor pool has been expanding and I do know that, and I can only speak for my hospital, like, cause you know, we've just been caught up like in, in patient care and haven't had a chance to regroup or really look at a lot of this data, but the donor pool is expanding. I can definitely say that. And we're being able to offer plasma therapy to more people. Um, and at, at, at many places, like, I mean, you know, if you've had, at, at first, the recommendation was if you have proven COVID, you can go and get yourself checked for the antibody and see if you can be a donor. But given how prevalent this is, now it's really just a viral illness. If you had viral symptoms, like in this time period, like four, six weeks ago, et cetera, you can go ahead and get the uh, antibody test done. Uh, and all healthcare workers are actually being advised to get the antibody done for this reason too, that you could become part of the donor pool. Thank you. Now we have a question or uh, uh, one of our attendees wants to ask a question. I uh, can't see their name, but they've, um, their, I, I suppose, caller uh, ID is Y92019. So, um, Walid, if you can allow them to ask the question. Thank you. Hello. Ji, assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Dr. Suhaib. 
Hassan, uh, I'm working as a consultant neurologist at National Medical University in Multan. Uh, I just want to ask uh, two things. Uh, uh, one th about the about the breastfeeding in the uh, in COVID-19 positive patients, uh, mothers like uh, breastfeeding the children. Any precautions for the, that? And uh, then the other thing I want to ask about the collection of the convalescent plasma. Are there any uh, precautions or what are the SOPs for the collection of convalescent plasma? The of COVID -19. I can, uh, I can take the first question, and maybe uh, Dr. Humayu can add from the Pakistan perspective. Uh, the what ACOG is recommending is that uh, at first, from China, it was like breastfeeding should not be done; infants should be separated. However, you know, considering that we are, uh, you know, depriving the mothers. Uh, and the baby of something that we have known to be beneficial for a long time. There are clear guidelines in the ACOG about you about breastfeeding, how to do it, mm -hmm. and uh, it is a sh that is why it is called a shared decision between the ah. clinical. Uh, between the the clinical as well as the uh, uh, the the clinical team and the mother. So it's a shared decision making. There are guidelines about if the if the infant is in the same room, how far to keep the infant, about hand washing, they, they also the alternative of expressing the breast milk and another attendant feeding feeding. But there is no guy there there is none of the societies that I looked at said you cannot breastfeed your child for the reasons of COVID. But it is a decision that has to be made um, by the mother and the clinical team. Doctor. Thank you very much. Uh, I think the second question is for Professor Humayo to, uh, and uh, other specialists from Pakistan to advise on the convalescent plasma status in Pakistan. We'd be interested in hearing that. Thank you. Yeah. I I don't really know somebody had said like the SOP on collection of convalescent plasma. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to share the protocol. I can send it to the um, Apna Merit email. But basically, you know, people are seroconverting pretty quickly after this infection. So in studies that have been done, like even at five days or so, you are mounting an antibody. The recommendation is to wait 21 days. If you are going to do antibody testing to see if someone's positive, you look at what the titer is, and if the titer meets a certain level, which in our institution is one is to 340, um, 320, like then you can move forward to evaluate them as a donor. But yeah, it's, it's, it's around three weeks at least uh, before you do antibody testing. Maybe Dr. Ali can, can weigh in on this, uh, Dr. Iqbal. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ali, thank you. So, uh, so uh, plas convalescent plasma therapy is being offered at Sorry, we lost the sound, Dr. Ali. She's in Yeah. So uh, the kids are being evaluated at the moment, but even with that, uh, the, uh, the plan was to just uh, based on history, uh, start collection uh, from donors. But I don't think we've had uh, uh, donors available yet at AKU, but NIBD has started collecting convalescent plasma and two of the patients at AKU got convalescent plasma from plasma which was collected at NIBD. So very- uh, We have Dr. Harun Akbal who has another question. Uh, Dr. Steroids, because uh, she or he said that steroids will actually proliferate uh, the vi virus in the throat. So one should not use the uh, steroids in the early phase of the infection. Uh, so my question is that there are asthmatics who are using uh, steroids, inhaled steroids or systemic steroids, but they will do because they cannot use steroids. And if they have infection, which is symptomatic or asymptomatic, so uh, there is a risk of proliferation of the virus uh, in the early phase of the of the infection. 
second uh, question is that uh, there are people uh, whose uh, screening tests are sometimes uh, positive, but when they go for RT, uh, 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 when, when they go for the other test, uh, that comes out to be negative. So I think screening test is uh, more sensitive than uh, specific. So is, is there a goal, a gold standard test so far developed anywhere in the world? Because like there are gold, uh, gold standard tests for the uh, typhoid, which is uh, uh, blood culture. W uh, will we be able to, uh, to develop uh, some sort of test which is considered to be a gold standard for COVID also? So these are my two questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Kabani, are you going to be able sure. to answer one of them? Sure, sure absolutely. The, uh, the question about the steroids, and this has been an ongoing controversy. Dr. Kaleem is here and he can also weigh in. Uh, but uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, the study that was done about the viral replication, I was looking at it recently, and uh, from what I can recall of it, that yes, there's viral, viral replication in the early stage. Does it translate into pathogen, pathogenicity and worsening? I don't think that was ever proven, number one. Number two, uh, if there is, if, so we don't know if this, th this is a theoretical or a clinical uh, problem. Secondly, if you have somebody on steroids long-term and you stop this steroids because of the, um, risk of COVID or if they get COVID positive, the, there is more harm done than good, just like the ACE inhibitors, because they will have an acute exacerbation of their asthma while they're having, having steroids. So no, my recommendation would not be to stop that very, very strongly. And, uh, uh, you know, I'll let Dr. Kaleem say uh, if you would like to weigh in on that as well. Well, um, I think uh, um, I totally agree with uh, uh, what you are saying. Um, the reported uh, controversies which was created is on the basis of uh, uh, pros and cons. Definitely there is uh, um, reported cases where the viral shedding uh, duration has increased with the associated use of the steroid. But the clinical significance of this a prolonged shedding, uh, we don't know what exactly uh, it's mean. Um, and you're absolutely right that a uh, patient who requires steroid because of many different conditions, including the respiratory conditions, as uh, our questioners ask, we do not recommend any stoppage of that. In fact, one of my patients uh, who has a sarcoid and I started him the treatment uh, just about two weeks prior to uh, he got the virus uh, in, a, in a family gathering where one of his nephew was uh, infected, uh, unknown, and then whole family got infected. Uh, we continued uh, his steroid with the same duration, of same dose. Uh, is he, st he is still shedding, but he clinically improved. Uh, he's back home. So that is what I would suggest that uh, you are absolutely right. We don't have anything else in that. As far as the, the other question was about the gold standard. So uh, the gold standard is RT-PCR. That is you identify the virus. As you already mentioned during your talk that uh, how to collect the sample, as Sarah has mentioned about the, the way the processing is done, um, that change the sensitivity of the result. Uh, that's the reason when in the seven day onward, when somebody is a critical ill, intubated uh, recommendation is to go for BAL because the sensitivity to that is about 95%. Now, combining the other tests like uh, antibodies detection, the tools which we have so far, the studies which I have seen, there are different uh, methodology, even ELISA and other kits which are available. The sensitivity and specificity of the IgG and IgM is kind of questionable. So uh, that's what we know. As time passes, we'll get more data and we may uh, go to the point. Now the culture is sometimes coming up indirect question and 
there is a strongly recommended not to do any viral culture. So the viral culture is not, should not be asking for doing a viral culture right now. It's just doing the RT-PCR for identification and for you know, finding out which patient is immune by doing the testing, whatever the kits are available. That is what my two cents is. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaleem. So my impression from what I've read and learned from is the current state of the antibody test, as you mentioned, to detect antibodies, the specificity and sensitivity and um, is not as good as the as the RT PCR diagnostic test is for toward diagnostic diagnosing the disease uh, or presence of the virus. I think it 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 depends on what we're looking for, right? So if, if we are diagnosing active infection, you know, for that reason, you would do the RT-PCR and all of the issues that were just um, outlined are there, you know, like the, the platform for doing this PCR, for doing the PCR for this virus was liberalized. So, you know, within a certain range, everybody is in a way doing their own thing. Like we have our own in-house assay in the hospital. You know, NYU has its own other in-house assay, and then there are commercial assays. So the sensitivity specificity is going to be different between all of these assays uh, because of the test itself, and then of course the collection technique, and then the type of sample. So um, you know, if you're repeatedly seeing something negative on a nasal PCR, get an oropharyngeal swab in addition to a nasopharyngeal swab, and if you are if the patient's intubated, especially, certainly send off a lower tract specimen because that will improve uh, the yield of your diagnosis. And the same thing with serology. I mean, this is a brand new virus. So there, re there is definitely no good data on sensitivity, specificity of serologic testing or any type of testing for that matter. Everybody's quoting a different number for it. Thank you very much for uh, I, may, um, I have a question. Sure. Go ahead, please. And, uh, yeah, so uh, I would like to thank the speakers for, a, for an excellent presentation, extremely informative. My question is uh, how to deal with pregnant healthcare workers. Is there a policy in place at uh, your institution whereby you limit uh, pregnant healthcare workers from uh, their clinical duties or you reassign them to areas uh, where there is less risk or uh, uh, how are hospitals dealing with their pregnant healthcare workers. I, I, mean, think, I, I think this course. also, sorry. Um, no, go ahead, Sarah. Uh, between mm -hmm. institutions, but uh, where I am, like at least for the, um, and I'm pretty sure the same is true for the nurses, like, but for the doctors, um, basically a large remote pool has been developed of healthcare providers, because as um, Dr. Kabani was saying, like there's an emphasis and a need to be able to see these patients virtually. So there's lots of stuff that you could do sitting remotely without being inside the hospital or in the clinic. So a lot of people who are pregnant or have other healthcare concerns, you know, they are, they are sitting at home and are doing these consults and helping us in other ways. They've been taken out of patient areas. Uh, a lot of that has been done, uh, at least at my hospital. There's no formal policy, I don't think. I, I, I would second that in, in, in our University of Texas Southwestern system. Uh, all nurses and physicians who are over the age of 65, and believe it or not, we have quite a few of them, uh, have been sent home to be on home, what's called a, uh, you know, a backup pool. And they do other duties, consultations, uh, teaching assignments, etc. Uh, whereas and that also includes uh, uh, women who are pregnant. So pregnancy and some, some di uh, people who have di diabetes have also been advised to uh, not come to the hospital for the, till, till probably May 8th. I think I read in one of my, uh, the guidelines, it might have been the UK guideline that after 28 weeks of pregnancy, I think it was 28 weeks uh, later in pregnancy, they are not as they are asking the OB, the pregnant uh, healthcare worker to stay at home. Uh, but I'm not. 
yeah, yeah. I, I, but, I but I've seen that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then the well, UK has actually been really good about that. It's more uniform across their system. Right. They are protecting pregnant women, right. supporting them and helping them stay home. Right. Thank okay. you. Now, I have a couple of questions because I don't see any uh, questions about this topic from the audience. Uh, actually, there is a hand raised. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. And that's Professor Shamsa Humayun. Please go ahead. I think it's Dr. Nigat Ahmed. Yes. Yes, it's me. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> about the policy in the hospital policy device all the healthcare workers so I was star uh, nurses on I were doctors on if they are pregnant if they are asthmatic yeah diabetic have to uh, we uh, keep them away from the COVID patients um, thank you okay thank you Hi. Uh, thank dr you. dr Nighat. Thank you so much, uh, Noorta and Sara. Excellent, excellent as usual presentations. My concern is that who, dekhe, uh, how are we going to follow up the survival group bhi hai, jo nikal rahe in hospitals, se, jo mothers who are going to deliver, go home, they are COVID-19, who's going to be teaching them, uh, you know, uh, uh, how to take care of themselves and their baby at home. I think our population is so much. We have final year medical students in colleges. We have these um, above 65 healthcare workers who will be staying at home. I strongly recommend that somebody has to follow the survival group, whether they are, in, um, they, have, they are mild when they were delivered or whether they were moderate or whether they were intubated. They are going home. Uh, we don't want them to infect others. And uh, here, I think, uh, Noor Mahal, it's time to do the home isolation thing and the guidelines. Um, and Saira, uh, Titus Care Foundation, uh, uh, volunteer has put them up in Urdu also. But we need volunteers, doctors, or you know, educated people to keep a tag on these patients who are going home, who have survived COVID-19. These people also need a lot of you know, uh, psychiatric help. It's not easy to take a baby home um, and be COVID-19, whether it's mild and moderate. So we have to think about that also. I think we're just dealing right now with the tip of the iceberg. I uh, totally agree, Nigat. And I would say that, you know, there is a group of a very good work that they could do. Um, uh, and maybe you can reach out to people that are locally there. Call them in. Very good point. Thank you. I do have a question related to this topic from the panelists, uh, and that is about magnesium therapy, which has been considered a sort of uh, not contradicated, but certainly cautious caution. So if you have, uh, certainly in the United States, if there's a lady who's pregnant and, in, and develops hypertensive disease and uh, has other features of preeclampsia, they'll be no normally they would be put on magnesium as a prophylactic. What will uh, be the recommendation if you have the double whammy of preeclampsia and a positive COVID-19 status? Uh, I, um, may I answer? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, uh, I, I addressed that in my, in my presentation somewhat. Um, I, the recommendation that I read and uh, Dr. Humayu can, can vein and this if, if she would like. The recommendation uh, that I read uh, was that uh, there is a concern for respiratory depression. It's an individual decision. Uh, you need to see how sick your patient is, what are the, uh, but you also need to protect the fetus for the neuro, neuroprotective state. And in that case, what they recommended is to give one dose of magnesium rather than the continuous strep. Um, uh, now, again, that would be up to our uh, obstetricians to see. Uh, and also, on the, I, I would think, thinking through it, that uh, it would also uh, depend on the gestational age of the, of the baby, how, you know, at what stage of labor it is. Uh, but there's no recommendation to completely not give it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we're coming up to almost one and a half hours of this. Uh, is there any questions from the participants to the panel or to the speakers? 
Iqbal, I wanted to uh, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, and everybody, uh, because this is the last nightly meeting that we had. Tomorrow, uh, we'll take a break. Uh, break. It's um, already Friday morning in Pakistan. So Saturday, there will not be a morning meeting from Pakistan uh, time. Uh, it'll be actually in the evening. So from now on, uh, we will not have nightly meeting. And so it has been a pleasure um, listening to such a wonderful speakers, panelists, experts. Uh, you really made this a great, great uh, program all these, um, I think, 22 days. Um, and I really um, thank and I hope that we will see you and uh, listen to you again uh, during the weekends, Saturday and Sunday, 5 p.m. on Sunday time. Thank you. Thank you, Shahid. You've been the driving force behind all this. We do have one question, and I think that was uh, addressed somewhat during Dr. Nurmal Kabani's presentation, but just to clarify, Dr. Amjad Iqbal wants to know, is delayed cord clamping still appropriate in a patient who has confirmed the suspected COVID-19? Dr. Kabani. Yes. Again, uh, the, the, the recommendations are conflicting. The, the reason behind not doing delayed cord, cord clamping is that you are ex, uh, increasing the exposure time to the best of my understanding. So uh, the, if I remember correctly, the ACOG says it can be done according to the situation. Uh, uh, whatever that means. And then uh, the uh, uh, Canadian College uh, advised uh, that we should go ahead and do it, uh, uh, you know, as we as we do clinically, otherwise for non-COVID patients. Dr. Humayu, I'll ask your opinion on this. Ji, uh, Dr. Bani, I was wondering, listening to your uh, presentation, if we are so much more, we are seeing that the ferritin level is high in the mother, so I am not sure about cord clamping, but if we don't do it, it, it won't uh, make any difference. Any, I mean, this is my own opinion. So many things, I don't think we know the answer yet, and the uh, decision is being left to the, to the bedside physicians to, to decide. So which recommendation you want to follow? Thank you. I think that's that's fair enough. And the, Dr. Uh, Maria Moten ha has a question about convalescent serum. After two negative, one week apart or more, will antibodies be elevated by then? Uh, and that's a question for, I, I think, Sarah and uh, Sarah Tamur and Dr. Bushra Jameel. I think I addressed this uh, somewhat. So, um, you know, right now, like antibody testing is recommended at 21 days. So you wait at least three weeks from uh, the illness, from the initial test that diagnosed the active infection. And at that point, like, uh, you know, if you're seropositive, depending on what the titer is, you could qualify for convalescent plasma. The candidates for convalescent plasma are those who are within the first week of illness and are not, they're sick, but not, not you know severely sick and intubated, etc. So, is there a certain criteria for in terms of uh, steps that if if they reach a certain level of disease that it's no longer an option? Would that be intubation or would that be some other laboratory? Uh, yeah, no, not so much laboratory, like it's more the severity of it. It's basically the time that has passed since illness. Um, and I'll be honest, like, I mean, you know, I haven't seen, I'm not running the plasma protocol, but I haven't seen that being offered to people who are felt to have an overall poor prognosis from COVID. So, you know, like someone who was older, someone with a lot of comorbidities, you know, like, you know, in general, like is not being considered as a strong plasma candidate because their prognosis is felt to be poor from this infection, as is. 
Um, it's, it's mostly younger folks, pregnant women, as I said, and within the first seven days of illness, that's kind of the general window for when you can consider somebody for, for, for plasma. Okay. Thank you. I think that's the, actually, Dr. Kaleem has a, has a comment or question. Yes, so uh, as Sarah has said, this is we are all learning. Uh, the initial data, which we uh, first uh, published uh, case series from China, they have given uh, in patient uh, uh, one patient at ten, uh, day number ten, and the other patient uh, up to uh, day twenty, and they were using it in a very severe uh, patient as well uh, when they were use everything. So um, again. Uh, I think we are doing it here in the U.S. in a much better uh, way in terms of uh, putting it to uh, into some trial. So probably at the end, we'll have better data to uh, make our recommendation much more uh, fruitful. Thank you very much. So I think uh, with that, I really want to thank uh, the two speakers, Dr. Noor Mahal Kabani and Dr. Sarat Manur. I want to thank all the panelists, uh, especially the ones who uh, joined from Pakistan. Uh, it's really very, it's a great learning experience for us in the U.S. to hear what your experiences. And I think we could go on for till Seri and not have all the questions answered. So we will have special sessions, I think, which will focus on answering a lot of the questions that have, that have piled up over the last 23, 24 days of webinars. So we will, uh, you know, it'll be answered by a panel of experts uh, and we will look forward to meeting again inshallah when um, in, in the coming days at uh, 5 p.m. Pakistan Standard Time. So with that, um, I want to say khudafis to everybody and thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, khudafis. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.